Welcome to the third session of Great Lakes Traditional Ecological Knowledge Speaker Series. Today's session is titled TEK in Great Lakes Areas of Concern Priority Setting Processes and will feature guest speakers um, from the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe and the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne First Nation in Canada. Um, and St. Regis Mohawk Tribe is on the um, US side. The border um, is dividing the community. Um, and they will be speaking on the St. Lawrence River AOC and the role of um, traditional ecological knowledge and helping to set and guide the priorities for that area of concern. Um, so to start, um, I'll introduce myself, Buju Anin, Anishinaabe Kwe, Nagani Kwe, Zigwan Kwe, Janakaz, Nagegan Dodem, Kwe, Dong, and Dunjaba. My name is Jessica Koski, and I am Anishinaabe from the Keweenaw Bay Indian community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. I am participating today from the Dakota homelands in Minnesota, where I serve as the regional biologist and program manager for the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Midwest region. I also serve as the U.S. co-chair for the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement Annex 10 Science Traditional Ecological Knowledge Task Team. The Great Lakes TEK Speaker Series seeks to connect and share lessons across Indigenous communities and increase awareness of the value of Indigenous knowledge and how to appropriately bridge knowledge systems. The series is presented by Annex 10 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in partnership with the University of Minnesota Twin Cities Department of American Indian Studies. It is organized by myself. Andrew Preston, who serves as, as the Canadian co-lead for the task team, as well as TK task team U.S. caucus member Jessica Dolan, who serves as an ethnobotanist on contract with the St. Regis Mohawk tribe in Aquasasne, and she is also a member of the Conservation Through Reconciliation team based at the University of Guelph in Ontario. Um, so at this time, I will pass it to Andrew to cover some of the logistical and housekeeping items for today. Yeah, hello, welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Preston. Uh, I am a senior policy analyst with Environment and Climate Change Canada and the co-chair of the Great Lakes Water Quality Annex 10 TEK task team with uh, Jessica Koski, as Jessica mentioned. I'm speaking to you today from the uh, lower Ottawa River watershed on unceded Algonquin territory. Before getting started with today's program, I'd uh, just like to uh, go over some housekeeping items. First, in terms of how this session will unfold today, there'll be uh, four presentations, after which we'll move into the question and answer portion of the program, uh, which will last for 20 minutes or so. 
Dr. Michael Dockery will be facilitating the Q and A's. Mike is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation with traditional territories around Southern Lake Michigan. He's also an assistant professor for tribal natural resource management in the forest resources department at the University of Minnesota, as well as an affiliate faculty member in the American Indian Studies Department there. Everyone has been placed on mute for the session. So to pose your questions, we would like you to use Zoom's Q&A function. You should see the, uh, the button for that at the bottom of your screen. We will be collecting questions as they are posed throughout today's presentations, uh, and we'll return to them during the Q&A portion. So please go ahead and submit your inquiries as you think of them, rather than waiting for the Q&A segment to, to uh, begin. And if you want to share other information with the larger group uh, in attendance, please use the chat function. And if you're posting to the larger group, uh, take care to ensure that uh, you address your note to all participants. Um, and with respect to that, if you could uh, go ahead as well and share uh, your nation or the traditional territory that uh, you're currently on, that would be uh, great. Uh, please do that uh, in the chat function. Uh, finally, I uh, just want to introduce the lead organizer for uh, today's session, as well as the moderator for today, Jessica Jock. And Jessica is the Remediation and Restoration Program Manager, ma uh, Manager for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribes Environment Division. She supervises uh, a considerable team that works on a range of environmental remediation projects adjacent, uh, rather, uh, sorry, uh, works on a range of environmental remediation projects that affect uh, Aquasasta territory, including the St. Lawrence uh, River area of concern. She's a member of multiple committees on behalf of St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, including the Great Lakes Executive Committee, the Annex 10 TEK Task Team, the US Caucus, and the Lake Ontario Partnership Working Group. She has a background in environmental science and engineering, and has worked on contaminated sediment sites for 20 years. Uh, as well as worked for the St. Regis Mohawk tribe and the Mohawk community of Aquasasne for 19 years. So we're very lucky to have Jessica with us and, uh, and thank you very much, Jessica, for uh, moderating and I'll pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Jessica, for the warm welcome and introduction. I'm joining from my home today, um, adjacent to the waters known as Niganjage, uh, part of the traditional Mohawk and Haudenosaunee territory. Niganjage in the Mohawk language means full of large or big fish. It also means Messina village. And uh, Niganjage waters are also home to the Agyantalon, which is the lake sturgeon. And lake sturgeon is a Mohawk cultural significant species and importance in not just consumption, but for medicine and healing. And the Niganjage, when we talk about the Grass River, the Grass River is part of the St. Lawrence River area of concern. And it's, it's appropriate sometimes to remember the connection of the language and the fish, as well as the contamination that we'll talk about later today. So I'm excited to give the audience a glimpse into the process that we've used in the St. Lawrence River area of concern to apply Mohawk traditional ecological knowledge in priority setting and resource management decisions. But I'm even more excited to introduce the panel of presenters, Satayogwa, Brenda, Amy, and Abe, whom I consider both my colleagues and friends. Even though my role as program manager, it is I who have had the privilege to learn from each of them. Our discussion is always empowering and it feeds my soul, and I hope we get to some of that live discussion today. With that, it gives me great pleasure to start this panel by sharing with the audience a meaningful song, The Water Song, by the Aquasasne Women Singers, and introduce Satyogwa Bucktooth to share its meaning. Satyogwa Bucktooth is the founder and medicine maker of Snipe Clan Botanicals. After completing a four-year apprenticeship program through the Aquasasne Cultural Restoration Program in the area of traditional medicine and healing, she felt the need to continue her work with plant medicines and so Snipe Clan Botanicals was created, a business of bringing people and plants back together. Satyogwa also works as a contractor with the St. Regis Mohawk Tribes Environment Division as our TEK consultant. And with that, I open the, the meeting to the song. <laughs>
Shall I go ahead? <laughs> so, Sako, everybody, my name is Satnayokla. I wanted to talk a little bit about Gundi Wanahawi or Carriers of the Word. They're um, a singing, a women's singing group from here in Akwazasne, the Mohawk Nation. Um, they started in, I believe, 1999 with a core group of about four or five women. Um, those same women are still a part of the group. Um, a few have unfortunately passed on for our um, passed on for health reasons and you know just their time in life so it was really nice to see the video and see their faces again um i used to sing with them when i was a teenager uh, <laughs> it was to help me stay out of trouble <laughs> as we all know teenage years can you know you want to push the limit so um my aunt maxine uh -huh, would be the one who i would go to when my mother couldn't handle me anymore. So she would take me on the trips when the women singers were um, doing their performances. So I had the pleasure of traveling um, across the Confederacy. We would go to Six Nations, um, Ontario to sing. We opened up the um, a museum in Washington, DC one year. It was a huge event. Um, events like the Ganatjohalege Strawberry Festival every year. Um, they were a big part of that and all of their performances and the proceeds that they would generate from them would go right back into the community. They were huge supporters of the Akwazasne Freedom School and um, ensuring that the language would be carried on, hence the name Gundi Wanahawi, Carriers of the Word. And so they would incorporate different Ganyakeha uh, Mohawk language into their songs and with the hopes that people would, you know, learn those words and at least it was that little bit that would be passed on. So they still continue to sing today. Uh, a little bit difficult in this day and age. So a lot of their performances have been virtual. Um, so if you ever want to check them out, they're on social media, Facebook, um, you can YouTube and I hope you enjoyed their music. I, I miss those crazy ladies. They refer to themselves as the Akwazasne Women Sinners, <laughs> but they're the best group of women you'll ever meet. So I hope you enjoyed their music. Nyama. Nyawa Sateogwa. And Nyawa Sateogwa for continuing the language and the songs and the teachings from the Freedom School that um, are so closely tied to some of the things that we've learned ourselves at the Environment Division. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and give a brief, as brief as I can, um, introduction of the St. Lawrence River Area of Concern. Uh, can everybody see my slides okay? I guess, I guess I'm assuming you can see them because I can't hear any response. So welcome to the St. Lawrence River Area of Concern. And um, as I was introduced already, I am the program manager for the remediation and restoration program for the tribes environment division. And I have been involved in the St. Lawrence River area of concern for at least 15 years. Um, so I'm just gonna try to brief through some of the overview of how the St. Lawrence River area of concern was identified as one of the most um, impacted areas of contamination in the Great Lakes through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Um, starting in 1980, I'm sorry, 1987, when, when the areas were identified. Aquasasne was part of the St. Lawrence River area of concern. So was uh, Cornwall, Ontario in Messina, New York, uh, in terms of some of the, the townships and communities impacted. The, the contamination, I'll, I'll show a few slides later from the different industries on both the North Shore and the South Shore of the St. Lawrence River, which is a binational reach of river. Um, the primary contaminants of concern included mercury, primarily from the North Shore, but also uh, PCBs, dioxins, furans, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, heavy metals, including um, aluminum and, and others, and, and a slew of other organochlorine chemicals um, coming from Lake Ontario. So um, those are the primary contaminants that, that we've been monitoring over the last 30 years now. And the when we start talking about beneficial use impairments, we're gonna get into some technical language in a presentation by Amy Benedict later. Um, but, but a lot of 
uh, the technical jargon comes from these documents, uh, the 1989 stage one document, uh, which um, identified the, the areas of impairment, the beneficial uses that were impaired in the, the North Shore. And then um, the 1990 stage one document that identified the beneficial uses that were impaired in the Southern Shore or US domestic portion of Messina and Aquasasne. So what you notice is in those older documents, it only identifies Cornwall and Messina and it doesn't mention Aquasasne. And um, in part that was uh, because of some decisions made um, from taking it from a binational area of concern and focusing more on, on the, domest the domestic portions of uh, Ontario and New York State. But in 1994, there was a binational statement that does recognize the sovereign territory of Aquasasne and the impacts. And in those documents, it did include some reference also. And Amy, Amy will talk more about that later. But uh, the one thing that I wanted to mention that helped pave the way with where the St. Regis Mohawk tribe is today uh, in terms of the process of really taking the traditional ecological knowledge and, and making it applicable to the, the technical terms and the beneficial use impairments under Annex 1 of the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is in part because of our resource management agreement with uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation that was in 2019, a cooperative agreement where we, we identified our, our individual jurisdictional areas of the waters, as well as the, the co-coordination, the co-management of the resources that are shared by both sovereigns. And so here, um, you can see the St. Lawrence River area of concern is this purple uh, diamond, which is a binational AOC within the Great Lakes. And this is the geographic area that we're referring to today. From an older document, we don't really have a, a good binational um, map that depicts both the contamination areas on the North Shore as well as the South Shore. So this figure is from a 1997 report and I wanted to share it because it does show the different, you can see um, the triangles on the North Shore. This is in Ontario and those are the industry uh, locations in, in Ontario. And then on the Southern Shore in Messina, we have Alcoa Reynolds and the former General Motors site. But what this map doesn't really clearly depict is the Aquasasne Mohawk territory. And in 2019, when we did our co-coordination agreement with DEC, one of the updates that we wanted to do was make sure that we had a map that better demonstrates the, the St. Regis Mohawk tribe jurisdiction, the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne jurisdiction, and some of the traditional use areas. And because this map was developed just for the US domestic portion, it intentionally doesn't include any of the North Shore um, and Cornwall, Ontario traditional use areas. So it just demonstrates, you can see in the orange stripe lines, that's a traditional use area. And then the yellow is St. Regis Mohawk Tribe and the orange is Mohawk Council of Aquasasne. But what was important about this figure is that for, for the majority of the purpose of the binational St. Lawrence River area of concern in the St. Lawrence River or connecting tributaries um, that, that also are included in the U.S. domestic portion, the Grass River, Racket River, and St. Regis River, many of the waters are either in tribe jurisdiction or traditional use areas. So as a brief background, Grass River, um, the, the industry was, was Alcoa East, now, I'm sorry, Alcoa West, Arconic. This uh, began operation in 1903. The, the contaminated sediments which is the primary concern for, for transfer of, of contaminants for, uh, to humans from either uh, fish consumption or when we talk about other traditional pathways, uh, consumption of wildlife and plants and medicines and, and other, other mechanisms. Uh, th this is a seven mile stretch of contaminated material. And this is also the same seven mile stretch is part of the 1796 treaty and Niganjage, as I mentioned earlier. 
The former Reynolds Metal site, it's now closed in 2013, but it was on the St. Lawrence River and there was significant dredging that took place in 2001. Uh, for the US domestic portion, again, the former General Motors site, which um, filed for bankruptcy in 2009 and since has been in a demolition uh, phase with a, 20, a final site restoration in 2020, but there's still uh, PCB contaminants on Mohawk uplands for remedial activities. And the Domtar paper mill is one of the most recognized uh, industrial sites from Cornwall, Ontario on the North Shore. Um, but that site was also closed in 2006, but you can see the longevity of the site with its opening in 1881. So real quick, um, Amy will be discussing more our, our beneficial use impairments and how the, the TEK has been integrated into the, the removal criteria. But um, I wanted to include this slide because one of the ways that helped pave our efforts to, to do some of the, the monitoring was in, in the funding that we received in 2010, the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe received Great Lake Restoration Initiative funds. And we did our own surveys on avian turtle, freshwater mussel, fair bird mammals, and fish tumors. But it gave us the, the opportunity to integrate into the, the science monitoring then, as well as into the reporting, some of those cultural uses and be able to answer questions like, can we eat the muskrat and beaver again? Can we you know, safely use turtles in our ceremony? Um, you know, there, there were many different questions that were asked that, that weren't relevant to how the current criteria were set up under Annex 1. So we were able to, to start paving the path with that work to then lead to some of the other um, results with our, our fish consumption advisories, our wildlife consumption advisories, and focusing on species that were important to the community. This is a, a, a photo slide demonstrating some of the muskrat um, that were cooked from um, some of our, our, our elders and, and sharing. And it's, it's with those, those lessons that we learned in the monitoring, as well as recognition of the ways of knowing that have been shared with us in the past from the Haudenosaunee environmental protection process that Brenda will speak of here shortly, and, and the cultural damages that were identified from, from the industry during the natural resource damage assessment, and then implemented into a cultural revitalization program with the Aquasasani Cultural Restoration that we were able to continually learn how to look at both traditional ecological knowledge, traditional teachings, and the science and monitoring. This last slide I'm sharing is, is just to show a, a bit of the, the community transmission of, of that knowledge. Uh, this, this was primarily through the Aquasasani Cultural Restoration Program, where there were elders and community members uh, that, that shared knowledge of, of different expertise, whether it be trapping and hunting, lake sturgeon, um, medicine and healing. It, and it was, it was a very well attended event each year when they would give their demonstration. And with that, I wanna thank everybody very much and take an opportunity to pause while I introduce Brenda LaFrance and pull up my Others, actually, I'm gonna think I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and I'll go ahead and introduce Brenda. Brenda is one of my favorite elders in the community and I've learned so much from Brenda. And she has been an inspiration, I think, to all of us on this panel. Ms. Brenda LaFrance, uh, is a professional with over 30 years of experience in the areas of science, administration, and management, information systems, and education. She has a master's of science, uh, master's of business administration, and master's in industrial management with concentration in management information systems, and also holds a bachelor of arts in biology and chemistry from SUNY Potsdam. She is married to her husband, Jake, and has two children and three grandchildren and enjoys basket making, quilting, and gardening with heritage seeds. 
She has past administrative and governance experience, includes the opportunity to develop and administer health and health-related programs, a national drug surveillance system, overall administration of a local First Nations program and services, and serves as a political representative for a local First Nation. In the area of education, Ms. LaFrance has developed through First Nations Technical Institute and St. Lawrence College, a culturally integrated diabetes prevention specialist certificate program and culturally integrated courses for an indigenous environmental technician program, including workshops for environmental professionals interested in a culturally integrated environmental science. Professionally, she has designed an innovative environmental protection process funded by US EPA that is grounded in Haudenosaunee customs, traditions, and life ways. This methodology is employed in all aspects of environmental program design, monitoring, and planning in Haudenosaunee territories. For over 10 years, Brenda has provided consultation services to First Nations, federal agencies, and non-for-profit organizations that includes areas with management, capacity building, environmental protection, culturally-based environmental educational programs, economic development, and adult education. Her publications include aspects of culturally integrated curriculum design and Aboriginal research issues. It was a great pleasure. I introduce Brenda and I will share my screen for her presentation. Basically, it says I'm old and I've done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope this works because I, I modified it early this morning and sent it off. So I haven't had a chance to really work it over, but I was uh, asked by our traditional confederacy, Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, whatever name people are familiar with, to uh, work with uh, knowledge holders in, in uh, our territory across uh, New York State and part of Canada to develop a method for environmental protection that <clears throat> the US EPA and other scientific, Western scientific communities could understand on um, what are our ways of knowing. So we looked at, um, we opened up the dictionary and we said, okay, what does science mean? And so um, it's basically ways of coming to know and every culture in the world practices it. And um, we showed, demonstrated to the federal agencies how Western science and Haudenosaunee ways of knowing can complement each other. So the research began, and this is extremely condensed, so I've left out a lot, and I'm hoping that it doesn't get too confusing for people. But um, the first thing that uh, we worked on was looking at what are our teachings that are relevant to uh, environmental protection? And our creation mythology is actually the core of our existence. And when we pe people were put on the earth by the creator, his one request was that we give thanks for everything that is on the earth and in the sky. And, um, so from that, everything that we do, all the teachings that we've received, all of our Thanksgiving address, the, the message of Handsome Lake, the great law of peace were all given to us by our creator for the purpose of reminding us that we need to be grateful and give thanks every day to everything around us on the earth. Um, so, the reason that we are so emphatic about sharing our knowledge is because our creator told us that we need to speak for the all of creation to other human beings because they cannot speak to man themselves so we are sort of the go-between and the mouthpiece for them as, and as part of our responsibility we have developed the intense observation methods for monitoring the world to see what changes are happening and remind 
other people and other nations and other governments that things are happening that are changing the natural world. So through the creation mythology and through the first people that walked the earth, we were given the Thanksgiving address. Later on, we were given the great law of peace which was to bring our people back into a state of peace and harmony. And we were reminded that we all are to share everything because we don't own anything. And the one dish, one spoon principle came into life. And that is that we all eat from one dish with one spoon and everyone shares where there's no concept of greed or selfishness in our culture. Uh, we um, are only supposed to take what's needed and other nations in the world are expected to share and protect in the same manner. The Thanksgiving address was given to us at the time of creation. And in that Thanksgiving, every component of the natural world is addressed and given thanks. And we do this in the morning, we do this in the evening before we go to bed, at gatherings and at ceremonies. As well, all of our ceremonies are Thanksgiving ceremonies where we gather at specified times of the year and give thanks. And we've been told in our prophecies that as long as we do this, Creation will take notice and recognize that we are grateful and they will continue to survive. That's been a, a rather challenging as all of the earth changes are happening and they are pretty much out of our control, but uh, we continue to fulfill our obligation. Now, I'm not gonna go through this whole diagram because it's this was designed to demonstrate to outside governments and agencies that we do have a valuable, valid method for identifying what's going on in our natural world. So the category area is basically all of, Thanksgiving, all of the areas in the Thanksgiving address from the waters of the world and the animals in the water the land, all the animals and insects and uh, entities that are on the earth, the birds in the sky, the four winds, the uh, all of the sky world and all of the, the thunders who uh, give, bring the waters of the world. Um, so those are the categories that have been incorporated into the, the Haudenosaunee environmental protection process. The factors was, was a bit more um, detailed. So I'm not gonna go into that right now. Uh, and then there are sub factors. And, but I think what's, what's critical that you could look at today are the criteria and the indicators. So in, this, uh, in HEP, we developed criteria for what is a healthy component of that natural world. How vital is it? Does it continue to still perform its functions? If it doesn't, what are the inhibitors that are preventing them? And so in that whole process, one of the things that we developed as a research method was through quantitative research methods that are defined today is observation and we developed an intense observation method that recognizes the interrelatedness of all creation. We recognize that changes in one species or life force like the winds, the length of sunshine, the length of seasons, et cetera, and how that impacts other parts of the natural world. Quality of air, quality of water, earth, and what the impact is on other life forms. And these are all have been and continue to be monitored by our people. So one example, this is the basic, basic composition of the HEP. So that all of our, all of our Thanksgiving address, great law, 
creation story, the knowledge tools we have, the recent cultural work and other uh, traditions and oral traditions are all brought in and assessed and criteria are developed. We look at the indicators for, so how do we know that, uh, for example, the fish are healthy, that they're uh, exhibiting uh, vitality um, what are the changes that are happening? And all of those are measured. And uh, for example, like we, we kind of knew something was wrong in the waters long before the uh, state and federal governments decided that something needed to be looked at. And they told people, our fishermen, our trappers, told people that we needed to avoid consuming the river life. And um, we also know that those contamination factors have contributed to a lot of human illness here that has never been um, attributed exactly to a particular contaminant. Because in Western science, we break it, it's broken down into little pieces. Um, in our society, we look at the whole and then look at the little pieces. Um, and we also don't have political influences in our teachings to prevent us from doing adequate cleanup. So like um, in, in our river life, for example, Western scientists attempted to research and identify what was wrong. Um, and un but unfortunately the contaminant couldn't be linked. Um, in this whole uh, HEP process, the indicators are usually local. They're for a particular Haudenosaunee nation or geographical area. So for example, Onondaga Lake, they have their particular um, contaminants that they're looking at that they've seen um, being adversely affected by whatever contamination has been going on there. And um, they are measurable and uh, they enable us to determine if, our, if that particular part of creation is healthy and viable. So um, I hope I didn't go too fast, but anyway, you can ask questions later if there's any interest. Um, so we believe and continue to believe and we've pressured and I believe that uh, the state and federal agencies are now recognizing that we have valid knowledge that and that our knowledge can support the Western science technological practices that are done in the in the res, in the in all of the world. Uh, we have knowledge of traditions and teachings and current research and development on environmental protection within our territories. It's a comprehensive holistic protection process that focuses on health. And it allows us to integrate Western science and our own knowledge systems. A young man worked with me, James Costello, and his role was to identify all the Western scientific methodologies that we needed to employ in looking at a particular component of the natural world. Uh, he did a fabulous job. And uh, so our document that finally evolved was an integration of both the Western and our traditional methods for environmental monitoring. So in a nutshell, uh, we believe that Western science and our science can support each other on equal footing, not with one being superior to the other. We need each other to help the natural world survive and flourish for the future human population as well. Thank you. Niawa, Brenda. I am sure many people have questions to ask you of the Haudenosaunee environmental protection process, but I'm just going to remind the audience that there will be a live question and answer session after the presenters have wrapped up um, at the end. 
And uh, we welcome everybody to go ahead and put your questions in the chat for now. And uh, Michael or Jessica Dolan will, um, will manage them for the time being until we can get to that live question and answer time. The next presenter to follow with um, information how that, that HEP process was, was integrated into some of our removal criteria is Amy Benedict. Amy Benedict is the environmental planner for the remediation and restoration program at the St. Regis Mohawk Tribes Environment Division. And she also serves as the St. Lawrence River Area of Concern at Messina Aquazasne co-coordinator with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Amy has been using her skills with geographic information systems, graphic design, marketing, and communications to serve her Mohawk community for over 28 years in the Tribes Environment Division and Communications Department. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me just uh, take a minute to figure out how to share my screen. And I do think I have it up. Can somebody confirm? Excellent. All right, I will be presenting the process we use to create TEK beneficial use impairments removal criteria for the areas of area of concern affecting the Aquazasta community. I'm going to start with a short history of the ALC and why we felt it was important to integrate Mohawk cultural use losses into the project. Uh, Jessica showed this map a little earlier. So the St. Lawrence River area of concern at Messina was designated in the late 1980s. Three contaminated Superfund site greatly impacted the Mohawks traditional practices. One of the contaminated sites along the Grass River had a huge impact on the historical gathering of subsistence and medicinal plants in an area known as Indian Meadows. And that is this section right here along the Grass River. When the appearance and their removal criteria were initially drafted, the tribe provided input about traditional uses of the Mohawk culturally important fish, wildlife, and plant species. Our concerns and recommendations were not included in the final BUI removal criteria. In 1987, the tribe Mohawk Council of Akwazasne and the traditional government, the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs, collectively known as the Tri-Council, requested a meeting with state, provincial, and federal authorities to request involvement and funding at a government-to-government -government relationship and with sovereign decision-making for the impacted resources. The federal and state governments said it was their responsibility under the Great Lakes Quality Agreement and the tribe could be involved with input as a REC member. Finally, after three decades of efforts by the Environment Division personnel, the tribe established the co-coordination status for the St. Lawrence River Area of Concern at Messina. It is now known as the St. Lawrence River Area of Concern at Messina Aquazasne. This provided a means for the tribe to have decision-making authority in the processes and projects taking place on, in, and near the Aquazasne territory and the authority to make a management and funding allocation decisions. One of the difficulties we had drafting the TEK component was the Western science measurements of success. The federal agencies were receptive to integrating TEK, but were hesitant about using qualitative measurements as opposed to quantitative measurements. We eventually wore them down and now they are willing to incorporate qualitative measurements. So our team who are drafting the uh, TEK beneficial use impairment removal criteria are from many important local agencies. We have seven participants and we call them the Tech Talk team. Uh, they're from various backgrounds. Um, we just heard from the HEPP author, Brenda LaFrance, MCA Environment Division Program Manager, Abe Francis, our SRMT consultant, Satyoka, Dave Arquette represents the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force and the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs. Aquazasner Cultural Restoration Program Manager, Barbara Tarbell. 
and tribal representatives, Craig Arquit and Jessica Jock and myself. We started putting the team together in February of 2020, getting meetings scheduled and we're just starting to make progress when COVID shut us down. We started up again in July. During the drafting phase, meetings were held every other week. With TEK removal criteria having never been created before, we had no template, no model or guidelines to work from. It was slow going in the beginning, but the conversations we had were always interesting and I learned something new every meeting. So we determined what was important to Mohawks by using the HEPP that Brenda just presented, the Thanksgiving address and other traditional teachings like the great law and the creation story. Special significance was placed on the animals and reptiles of our clans and the wildlife and plants taught in our creation story. Beneficial use in parents. There are 14 listed in our area of concern. Of those, six are actively considered in pairs. Those six are listed in the purple writing. After careful review of previous study results, we determined that we would draft TEK removal criteria for three of them. Number one, restrictions on fish and wildlife consumption. Number three, degradation of fish and wildlife populations. And number 14, loss of fish and wildlife habitat. Studies and results for the fish tumors and other deformities and bird and animal deformity studies found no significant difference outside of our ALC. So they are being considered for delisting. Number six, degradation of benthos has propagation and habitat restoration projects being conducted due to Superfund remediation and does not require a TEK component. The first step in drafting the removal criteria was to just make some notes on all of the important concepts, efforts, and endpoints for the specific BUIs. The next several slides will focus on the restrictions of fish and wildlife consumption impairment. So basically during the meetings, people were just throwing out suggestions for teachings and stories and what would possibly uh, need to be included in there. And I'll go ahead and give you a minute to look those over. Okay, from those notes and from that information, we came up with these management actions. Now, these are not final and uh, we're still working on them. And the actions we're looking at are being planned to last about four years. It's a measurable goal tied to the Great Lakes Action Plan timeline. It's responsive to the US EPA's desire to delist the ALC before 2029. But of course, the more years we are able to continue this transfer of knowledge, the more healing can be done. Using the teachings and stories, we determined some actions that would fulfill the goals we selected. We did not select them all for action. We did know that some of the items would be applicable and could be incorporated to the other BUIs. The number and types of classes we hope to hold are draft. They could be changed and more or different ones added. For planning purposes, we expect to request 10 cl classes per BUI. The Fish and Game Advisories will still be a measurable metric by SRMT and New York State DEC and the Department of Health as a scientific tool measure of fish tissue contaminant burden and Mohawk subsistence fish consumption patterns and cleanup goals uh, that have been identified in the Superfund cleanup actions for risk reductions. We hope to create joint advisories with the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne, which include fish and wildlife that are significantly, significantly important to Mohawks. Any cultural fish use fish species contaminant questions will be supported by development of SRMT fish contaminant monitoring efforts and study design in coordination with New York State DEC partners and or analytical labs.
And here it is. Here is our draft TEK BUI removal criteria for the consumption of restrictions on fish and wildlife consumption. Um, it is a draft. It has not been reviewed or approved by SRMT management or any agencies. And to our knowledge, this is the very first, the very first uh, BUI removal criteria with TEK having ever been drafted. Okay, after the three BUIs had the teaching suggestions noted, management actions drafted, and a draft TEK removal criteria created, it appeared that the removal criteria fell into three sections of the management actions. Education, studies, and those studies include sampling, and public outreach. Our next steps include the adoption of a binational framework and get all the parties to acknowledge Mohawk sovereignty in this AOC for authority to make decisions on the binational AOC geographic scope in a tri-national agreement between the United States, Canada, and the Mohawk Nation. In conclusion, we look forward to finalizing the TEK removal criteria and presenting them to our community, local, state, and federal agencies. Thank you. I'm on mute. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Amy. Um, I appreciate everything you just shared, and I'm sure some folks have some questions for you, but we have one more presenter, and we are a few minutes behind schedule, um, so we'll try to make sure that there's time for Abraham Francis to give his summary and follow-up. And Abraham Francis is Deer Clan from Aquazusne and the current program manager for the Mohawk Council of Aquazusne environment program. He earned his bachelor's of science in microbiology and master's of science in natural resources from Cornell University. Previous positions held for the Mohawk Council of Aquazosne included community health representative, prevention and intervention coordinator, environmental project coordinator, and environmental science officer. His research interests are at the intersection of environmental studies, indigenous methodologies, community engagement, education, health, social services, law, and cultural foundations as a means for empowerment and healing within indigenous communities. His current work as program manager is where he can address and promote community concerns regarding the environment and conservation from a culturally grounded place to ensure that future generations have access to clean land and water. It is my great privilege to introduce Abe Francis for the summary presentation of the day. Thank you, Abe. Now, uh, Jessica, um, so Sego Sego Delugete Yungets, really great to be here and present to y'all. Um, let me get my presentation going. Um, and I will jump into it because I know we are very short on time. Okay, there we go. So um, basically, I wanted to really talk about how. Well, first, I want to be thank great. I want to give my gratefulness to all of the women that just spoke. Um, they really inform my work and are such an important part of what I do. And um, I'm really so appreciative to all of them. Um, and so, what I really want to pay attention to is how, through this work, we're asserting Aquas Solono sovereignty. And it's really important in this process that we're centering community voices through this. And one of my favorite things to do is to talk about Mary Tebow, who is somebody that really speaks to a rejection of this imaginary border that exists in Akwazasne and really drawing on the resources here in Akwazasne. Um, she was jailed twice, 90 days, um, for refusing to become an American citizen. Um, but also like what I think is really beautiful about her story is she supported her family with basket making. Um, and Akwazasne is one of the, is a community that is very well known for their fancy baskets. Um, and I really love this picture just because she's happy. Um, and I think that that is one of, that is a, a huge characteristic of us as Akwazaslono that we are 
a very happy people, at least generally, I like to believe. Um, and so you've seen this map over and over in various iterations. Um, for myself, I grew up right here at Lagozai, um, actually, yeah, right there at Lagozai Point. Um, and I've lived all over this reservation um, throughout my life. And it informs my work in so many different ways um, from the family that I'm connected to, from the friends that I've made, and the networks that I've built to understand my community in a deeper way and how my work reflects myself and my community and my connections and how I, I choose to incorporate those things. So <clears throat> one of the things that are very important to me and really thinking about or approaching a research process in Akwazasana and any, in any Indigenous community um, around the world is that I really think it's important to understand the context specificity of that community and incorporate that into the development of policies, procedures, research methodologies, really use that as a place, as a foundation to build upon. And so you have heard it in various, and you've heard this, that like Akwazasne has um, three different governments that operate. Um, we have the St. Regis Mohawk tribe that operates in the Southern portion and is the main body that engages with the United States. And then the Mohawk Council of Akwazasne in the Northern portion, which is where I work and engages primarily with the Canadian government. Now, what covers the entire community is the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs. And what I think is really, really wonderful about the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs being here is that the, the spire for the Mohawk Nation is here in Akwazasne, and that connects us throughout the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, there's a lot of value in that. There's other governments that exist in Akwazasne, but that's a very nuanced discussion that I don't think this group, we have time for right now. Um, additionally, I think um, Jessica and Amy really brought into this very, um, really contextualized for us, like the degrading of ecological relationships. And I really think about the implications of that engage of what happened there. And particularly Elizabeth Hoover's work um, on the implications of that was really informative to me that the loss of our connection, our, the loss ability, the loss of our ability to be in relationship with the fish had severe implications that weren't just in that direct contact way, which is, was the way that originally the, um, originally how our, the impacts were assessed was just us being in direct contact. Um, we lost pieces of our culture, we lost language, we lost values. And this is even part of a larger story and a part of a larger network of where we were subject to such powerful assimilation um, and purposeful. And so much of that was 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 against us. Um, you know, and it and it makes me think about the Kumaluns now and how that is even a part of this narrative and how our people are part of the Indian day schools and the residential schools. And it was, it was a, it's a combination. Now, also when we're thinking about this work, we wanna incorporate the biocultural context. And for me, my entire program and everything that I do here is based on the Ohan Begali with Dakwa, the Thanksgiving draft and our relational network that I've been, given the reins over here in the northern portion to take care of. And how can we do that in the best way? How can we develop monitoring strategies to do that? How can we engage and make sure that we're fulfilling our roles and responsibilities to our relations as is part of our teaching and the responsibility we were given? But also they care for us and this is part of that reciprocity. And also bringing in the Guyana Law Goa, the great law, um, the, the foundational principles of that and thinking about relationship building, skana, gasasasla, and gotni buhlio, peace, power, and a good mind, that these things are, are just really informative to think about the relationship with self, with other people, with um, collaborations, partnerships. It's just really this really great way of thinking about a good relationship between partners. Um, but also too, there's these stories and teachings that we can draw on. And the way that I see them is their methods. They're, that's methodology. And we can bring those things into the way that we work. Um, in particular, some of these things have been super informative the way that I think about education and community engagement. Um, my people learn different. They have a different epistemological orientation and we have to make sure that we are attenuating our approaches to that. 
Now, that's where the creation story comes in. And the creation story connects us right to this place, right here. And then the clan system being the story about grief and caring for each other and that we're here, we, we're on this landscape, our families are represented here and we support each other based off of that relational network. And then also our cycle of ceremonies, this annual reminder of our roles and responsibilities to each other. And one of my favorite things with that, Henry Lickers always told me was, what they are is a story about how we messed up. And this is our reminder to not mess up again. And so I really think about those moments and how we can think about education from that perspective and engagement, but also how these can be really informative to how we're monitoring the environment and being careful about how things are changing. And I think that Brenda really, really captured a lot of that very well in her presentation and how we go through that. Um, and then one of these things for me as someone, as someone trained in the Western sciences and frustrated by institutions and their inability to be accessible to indigenous knowledge and my people is this idea of all my relations. Um, you know, when I was doing my own master's thesis, I would ask what's important about the forests? And <laughs> the elders would be like, it's all important. But to me, that was like, well, if it's all important, then nothing's important. But that was just me trying to put things into boxes and create a hierarchy as I was trained to do by these institutions. So a lot of my, my journey has been be about decolonizing my mind and trusting my people's knowledge and relying on it as I move forward. And so um, just really what for me that kind of came out is complex connectivity and that my people are really close with the land that are we emerge from these landscapes are so much of who we are and how we relate is right here. Um, and then I just did this analysis and it showed all this complex relationships. You're not supposed to be able to read it because it's just really messy, but um, it really helps me in thinking about and putting interventions into place and approaching research. Now, some of these things that I thought were really good, really cool from my perspective was just how it was all connected in this really interrelated manner that species were a source of knowledge through the complex connectivity. And this was connected to the stories and goes back to the species. And it really made me think about, well, if we lose a species, what are the implications of that across time to my people? And in particular, we're really thinking about the implications of ash trees. Um, but I digress because we are talking about the area of concern. And for me, this is really about what, what is distancing us from the river? What is distancing from us, us from our relations? Because we need to be in relationship with them in order to access that knowledge, that, those teachings, those stories, so much of what makes us happy and well-grounded people, which we were robbed of for so long. And I wanna be a part of the mechanism that helps address those things and heal from that. Now, one of the ways that we absolutely have to do this, and this is what one of my particular frustrations with COVID is we can't be together. Um, one of the most, like one of the things that was just so critical to the success of my work and my graduate, um, graduate degree was um, this gathering. And I was able to get so many people from so many different groups some people that usually wouldn't even be in this cot in the same room together. Um, because we have two long houses in Akwazosne. Um, and they don't really communicate well with each other sometimes, but they are still a part of that network of what makes us so much of who we are. And what I was really beautiful to me was that um, Harriet Boots, who now passed on, it was a clan mother at one long house and she opened for us. And then Eddie Gray, who was a faith keeper at the other long house, closed for us. And then there was something really beautiful about that with the representation that was in the room, the way that we were allowed to just speak our minds. And, you know, even my mom was there and she did like in the moment translations for me were just really important and really spoke to the relational, relational network I have. Um, my grandmother was there, who's now passed on. Um, and she was just a strong advocate for Catholicism in Akwazasana and was a powerful force behind getting Karali de Gakwita canonized. But that those energies and all that knowledge could exist in the same space and support me in this effort to understand how we related to forests. And the products of that work have conveyed, have 
translated across so much. And I'm so grateful that I'm able to implement that in my partnerships and my research and the methodologies and so much of what I do. Um, and one thing in particular and thinking about kind of how I approach these things is the two row wampum. And you've heard about this multiple times, this agreement between Haudenosaunee and the Dutch, this two mutually consenting parties agreeing to respect the autonomy of each other in perpetuity. Um, and where I see this is that we have a way of thinking as indigenous people and Western sciences of thinking, and they're both valid and important parts of the conversation. And that we can create the space in the middle to support each other um, and develop methodologies of understanding. But what all that comes down to is respect for each other's ways of seeing the world. And that we have to negotiate that. And, and it has to be consent based. And you know, there has to be a mechanism to step away too. There's accountability here. And so it's been super informative to me in methodological development and the work that I've been doing with um, with the TEK BUIs, like in particular, we held this, we had this one amazing meeting that I left sweating from because it was just so good where um, Brenda and Flet the Ilgua were just talking and we were thinking about the ways that, how are we gonna, how are we gonna evaluate communities knowledge and relationship to this, to the land and to, and, and that we're healing and that things are improving and we, got to this really interesting space where we were asking ourselves, well, how do we even define family in Akwazasne? Because a family needs a hunter, a fisher, a basket maker, medicine person, language keeper, and that we could reach a capacity in the community where these things will just go right across the community and then we will become a healthier, happier community because of these interconnected relationships that we have. And because healing the land is healing ourselves too. And I think that through this process of asserting our sovereignty, asserting our voice, speaking up in meetings, not allowing ourselves to just be rolled over and accept that this is just the way things are um, and accept crumbs, that we can, we can put things into place. We can advocate for, for ourselves in such a powerful way. And we have done that. And I think that's one of the, another thing that is so characteristic about uh, being Akaza Solono is that we are stubborn and that our voices are loud and we will <laughs> we'll shut this border down at the drop of a hat if we feel like we need it. But also that like, it's really just that we are coming for everything that was denied us. That the damages on the land were damages on our bodies, on our culture, on so much of who we are. And really beautiful example of that for me was this broken basket that Carrie Hill, who's a basket maker in our community restored. And that really means a lot to me because like, I think about the, the land healing and then my people healing and through that process, we're engaging hope. And that in this process, it all comes back because we have these ways of knowing, these ways of understanding the land and it all comes back, the languages, the cultures, we're calling all of those things home that were stolen from us. And so I believe all this work across this international border that I have no respect for, nor does the ecology of Akwazasne. And that if we tap into that, we draw into that community network and that we can see these really, we can do this in the right way that, my people will change the narrative of this river that is just based in fear into something of reclamation and celebration. Because I don't want that to be the story that I tell my kids and that they tell their kids that is toxic. No, St. Lawrence is a place of knowledge, of medicine, of connection. It's, a, it's this really generative thing. And I've thought a lot about that for myself because of my grandmother, my father and their connection to the river and what that means to me and the work that I do now as an environmental project or as the environment program manager to care for the waters in the way that I do. Um, and so with that, I just kind of wanted to close that um, and that like, I'm so grateful to all these women and what they do and that we opened with such a powerful song. One of those really, um, really great things for them putting the language out there because the language is a part of the landscape and that the water recognizes that language and that there's this binational AOC that was a part of the original agreements and that like I get to work with Jessica and we get to push back.
and we get to align our stuff and we get to figure things out that just always felt like so complicated, but was it really complicated or did it just require more work? And that, you know, my people are worth that work and I wanna be able to give them what they deserve and what they need. And that I'm a part of this really great team that does that. And I appreciate Amy so much that she's helping <laughs> corral cats and putting our ideas together to, to develop these approaches to address these issues or these BUIs and what does that even look like and how can we do that and Brenda just because I love Brenda she's such a powerful force her work everything she's done like it's ultimately something that I've been able to be a part of and admire for so long and I'm just appreciative that I get to be a part of the conversation with her so Nyawa and I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this panel. So I, I think, um, thank you so much, Abe. Um, I, you got me tearing up a little bit here. I, I think Mike is gonna take over for some of the, the question and answers. And um, I, I echo everything you just summarized, Abe. Um, it, it is such an empowerment to work with a team of people that we do work with in Akwazasne. And um, we do push back and we push back for good reasons uh, because the community and the environment are worth the fight. So, so thank you. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it to Mike to, to um, take the questions. Well, Miigwech, uh, thank you. That's, this has been really powerful. Um, I'll just remind people that if you have a question, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, you can type in there. Um, and I wonder if, if our panelists, if you if you don't mind um, turning your video on and and Wesley, I don't know, Wesley, I don't know if you can have everybody be seen because I, I think I'll pose some questions and then we can just have a little discussion here for the next 15 minutes um, if that if that would work for folks. Um, I, I, I'm real curious how, you know, it's clear from the timelines that were laid out in, in, in the presentations that in the beginning, um, um, the Akwasane, uh, Akwasasne uh, communities were not involved in, in this planning for, for the restoration and the healing of, of the land and waters. And I wonder if you could all talk a little bit about how you were able to finally get um, get your tribes and sovereignty and voices and communities involved and, and essentially force the governments to see that you're here and kind of how Abe so beautifully um, brought us brought an end to his his portion there. You know, how did how did that work? And just feel free to unmute. That's a great question. And I think if Brenda wants to, to maybe contribute because I think she has some of the history of the early days and then I could um, maybe pick up from, from what she shares with more of the recent times. Yep, I am old. <laughs> I know, I realize I sounded <laughs> We'll talk about the old days and I'll talk about the younger days. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, well, it started back in the 70s when people started noticing that things were not right on Racket Point. And uh, there were strange things happening with the water life. Fishermen started noticing like the fish didn't look right, they didn't smell right, they didn't taste right. And, um, and people used to... You, uh, go in at night near Reynolds and they would uh, pilfer the aluminum and then sell it for you know for to meet needs at home uh, and so people started getting sick so uh, a group of us got together and the first group that was formed was called MASH and it was Mohawks Agree on Safe Health and that pretty much was sort of a small movement of people who had immediate concerns and didn't know where to go with it. Because at the time there wasn't an, an environment division at the tribe, it was a very small tribal government. <clears throat> so uh, we had a bunch of meetings and we talked about things and 
uh, we started approaching the leadership about it in the health department, which we didn't have at the time, like we do now, but uh, New York State Department of Health, and then there was DEC, and just getting people to come and uh, do presentations. And eventually they were, we ended up having uh, Randy Hart um, as working with the tribe, uh, sort of like doing some environmental work that was I don't know, probably quite groundbreaking. And, and then seeing the need that we needed to um, expand. And so the Akwazasana Task Force on the Environment was established. And so people from the MASH group became part of the Akwazasana Task Force. And that was um, a multi-governmental unification on environment. So nation representatives, tribal representatives, and um, band council representatives from the community decided to participate. So it was sort of a unifying factor. <clears throat> um, and then we, you know, we worked closely with the people who saw things, experienced things, uh, and lived our traditional lifestyle. And we just kept pushing and pushing and pushing over the years. And then finally, uh, we got EPA and DEC to acknowledge that there was contamination. And then the tribe's environmental program began to grow. The band uh, council, who is now Mohawk Council of Akwazasne, established an environmental division. They, there was a health study that was done. Henry was part of that. And um, the results were never released. So all we can assume is that there was something there that they didn't want people to see. But it was just basically what uh, Abe said earlier, you know, we were persistent, uh, we're vocal, and we don't back down. So if one thing doesn't work, we regroup and we try another way. And um, so the, I guess the HEP has been the latest. It's like, um, okay, EPA, you don't recognize our traditional ways of knowing, so we're gonna show you. So that was at the Confederacy level. And so now EPA recognizes it. And you know, there's a common language across the country about traditional ways of knowing, traditional ecological knowledge. Those words didn't exist, you know, when we were trudging along trying to figure things out. But um, I guess that's kind of it in a nutshell, how things evolved. And, and to add on to what Brenda shared, uh, she's absolutely right with if something didn't work, we would regroup and try again or on a different avenue. And so she had described the development of the different environment divisions for both the Sandwiches Mohawk Tribe and Mohawk Council of Akwazasne. And once the Sandwiches Mohawk Tribe's environment division was more developed, a lot of the work that we did was tied closely with the Superfund sites. So there's three Superfund sites. So under the Superfund program is where we um, were, were at the table. We were having um, direct involvement as a support agency to look at the technical details of the remediation, of the remedial design or remedial action. And as, as, that per, as we developed our relationships with EPA and DEC on the Superfund side of things, we were able to start integrating some of the cultural use into some of those decisions. So in the Grass River Superfund record of decision, there is a specific remedial action objective for Mohawk subsistence fishing people. And that it is um, a much more stringent cleanup goal than just the recreational fisher person. And there's um, for our habitat reconstruction plan, there's a, a cultural use component and including some of the, the plants of traditional value that um, with Satyogo's assistance and others from the Akwesasane cultural program, we were able to integrate into that. At the same time in parallel, well actually before some of those decisions, it was in parallel with the natural resource damage assessment and the cultural impacts that were identified there. And the tribe being the lead um, 
on on that with the other trustees. And so again, we had built our relationship with with the state of New York on that. And so the third to follow was the St. Lawrence River area of concern. So we had already improved our relationships with EPA and DEC on those other two processes, but then the, the binational or the domestic uh, St. Lawrence River AOC portion was the last to follow. And so it was that whole regrouping and, and, re and recalibrating basically and, and keep pushing and, until, until we could keep demonstrating saying, well, we're doing it here with this. Why can't we do it here with this? It, it makes sense. The figure that Amy shared and that I shared for the, the new St. Lawrence, I shouldn't say new, but the new map um, that's been used for the St. Lawrence River area of concern at Messina, Aquazofni, the traditional use areas was first identified in a community involvement plan by EPA for the Superfund site on the Grass River. So we were able to then just, you know, pull it from there and get support for it in the AOC. Wow, this is so inspiring. Um, and, and certainly that that pushing for change is, is, you know, something we can all really aspire to and continue to work together and share these stories because uh, clearly um, you are all sharing and um, your knowledges as these things were happening in the first place. But I think hopefully we can see some change with the governments that are starting to acknowledge the tribal sovereignty and acknowledge this deep, deep knowledge. Um, I'm gonna read a couple questions here that, that came through and I'll, I'll put kind of two of them together. Uh, one is um, if the draft TEK BUI removal criteria will be shared, and then how has the EPA uh, GLNPO reacted to adding criteria to these BUIs? Um, and did you add additional projects, management actions to the remedial action plan specifically to address cultural values? I, I think you, I think we had some examples, but maybe you can continue as well, or, or anyone can unmute. I'll go ahead and answer first, only because I want to compliment whoever asked that question for knowing their acronyms. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that that question made a lot of sense to me, to others on this panel, probably not. Well, for me though, I admit that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm, I'm going to pass, pass the baton to Amy, but just briefly, we plan to um, we have received support from EPA Glenpo office to draft and um, guide them on how we want to integrate this into the removal criteria process. And, we're, and it is still draft and um, we're, we're planning on presenting the full package in August of this year when we have our annual meeting. And, and Amy, I don't know if you wanna add to any of that of, of the acronym question. Well, those uh, specific examples I gave of the notes and the management actions are specific only to that BOI. Those plans and actions are not in, um, in the removal criteria in any other place and they were specifically added just for um, this TEK portion of this BUI. Um, one thing I didn't mention and I'm not sure like I said, everything's completely draft and we don't have the actions and everything completed yet. But we're hoping um, to keep our TEK portion right around $2 million per year for four years. So we'll see how well that goes over. Did that answer it? Do I forget something? Sounded pretty good to me. Okay. Um, that coupled with all the presentations. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us, we don't have too much more time, but I think, I think all of you can respond to this and maybe this will close us out here. But um, Abe, you really hit on it um, explicitly. Um, but I wonder if you all could talk a little bit more about the healing aspects of doing this work and the importance of it. <clears throat> um, I guess I could kind of take a hit at that one. It's kind of a big focus of my work. Um, the healing aspect of it. For me, it's like us returning to the land and being able to be in engagement with it again. You know, in particular, um, there was quite a resistance to the Grass River cleanup. And I even found myself feeling like that too about the Grass River cleanup at first. And just the frustration of people um, at the edge, at the, the 
different sort of information sessions and and a lot of it for me ultimately came back to the fact that people were there there were miscommunications happening but after listening to Jessica and listening to you know working with the tribe it's a necessary action um it's part of our responsibility to that river I think the saddest part of it for me was just it felt like we were denuding the ecology in that area. And that was sad to me, you know, but also it's a part of this journey and the land is going to heal itself. And just has this amazing like muscles project um, because there's this amazing ecology that was in that area that was allowing them to resist being like murdered by zebra mussels, which I thought was the coolest thing. Now, kind of going back to the healing process, right? Um, in being on the water, in eating fish, there's the conversations that we have as communities. There's language that we share with each other. There's values, teachings. There's so much embedded in that relationship and that action of being out there. And we have a role and responsibility to be in engagement with those fish. And those fish have a responsibility to us to be consumed. And so if we're not in that relationship, then what we kind of start seeing is a breakdown of our societal structure and can promote sort of this unhealthy endpoints for us. Um, we're not eating our traditional foods. We we may be subject to different kinds of health issues because of that. We may be um, looking for sort of ways to um, not feel so much of colonization. I don't know if not every, if everybody can feel that or understand what that means. Um, you know, the implications of capitalism and how it weighs on us and sort of benefits from the deficit model that promotes that. And what all of our culture and so much of who we are is this gratefulness for what we have and what is around us and acknowledging that and being in relationship to that and that for me in the end it is that will I want to see like reduced sort of um what I see as a colonial manifestations um trauma um you know domestic violence addiction um you name it it being out there and affecting us in this really dramatic way um and that's where i kind of see that inner relationship and that the land is healing itself and it is healing itself it's so much better around here than it used to be but because the story is just so sad and and about like fear we can't even see it we there, i think there's just so much grief and there are teachings and things that we can use to connect to that and help move through that but again a lot of it for me comes down to communication and tapping into that network throughout our community and getting our information out there and it's really hard to do but like we know everybody's business around here we know what happened yesterday and <laughs> kind of connecting within that network and how do we tap into that and teach people about the environment and how things are improving so we can reap the benefits of that and that the environment can benefit from that relationship too. I, I mean, there's so much more to that like discussion um, that I've actually like been able to talk about, write about, but like, I just, it's, that's my like, a kind of like shortened, hopefully explains it better <laughs> way. Wow, this is great. I, um, we could obviously go on for a couple more hours here together. Um, I'm hoping that we have the opportunity to meet in person as, as we start to move around again. Um, it's been really inspirational for me. And I think, I don't know, Jessica or um, somebody might kind of finish us up here as well. Well, I, I oh, I didn't know if you were referring to meet Jessica Koski. There's three there's Jessica. So many. <laughs> there are three. <laughs> well, I saw Jessica Jack unmute, but I also know, so. <laughs> Whoever wants to, to bring us out, that would be great. Yeah, um, I will. Chimigwich, thank you so much. Um, Jessica Jock, Satyokwa, who is also our opening and closing address speaker for the series as a whole. To Brenda, Amy, and Abe, we are so grateful for your words and your perspectives and the incredibly important work and leadership, persistence, and dedication that each of you are individually and collectively doing for the healing of the lands and waters of the Eastern doorway of the Great Lakes. This is such an important story and I'm so grateful we have been able to support sharing it more widely through the speaker series. Um, miigwech, thank you also to Mike um, and Jessica Dolan behind the scenes helping with the Q&A facilitation. And also Wesley Ballinger with the University of Minnesota Department of American Indian Studies helping to run the room, um, the Zoom room for us today. Um, 
And just a reminder for next week, Wednesday on June 16th will be the fourth session of the series on TEK guided research to address community-based chemical concerns. Our guest speakers will be Evelyn Ravindran with the Keweenaw Bay Indian Community, Valerie Ganyu from the Michigan Technological University, as well as Heather Patterson with the University of Guelph. Um, so with that, um, I just want to, again, express my appreciation to um, our panelists and speakers today and the audience and attendees. Um, and miigwech. Thank you.